The Dharma, incomparably profound and exquisite, is rarely met with even in hundreds of thousands of millions of kalpas. We now can see it, hear it, accept and hold it. May we realize the true mind of the Tathagata. Today is the sixth day of this seven-day session here at Mountain Gate in northern New Mexico in March 2021. And it's actually almost towards the end of the six days. So we don't even have uh, the rest of, uh, much of the rest of the sixth day plus the seventh day left in Sashin. If you've been working hard, that's not a problem. And uh, you're ready to go even deeper. And hopefully that is the case. It does seem to be. So just keep going. I've shared um, much of the relevant to us um, portions of um, Musa Sosaki's conversations with the uh, Ashikaga brothers in, in terms of Zen practice. Uh, the rest of it is really very technological. And by that, I mean uh, lots of, of um, well, not technological in terms of how to do the practice, but a lot of intellectual background, which is not necessary, particularly not at this stage in, in the Sashin. What's most important is the practice. The deepening letting go so that we can open to this fantastic, amazing, and yet totally ordinary mind with a capital M of awakening, which every single one of us is endowed with and we can open to it. So I'll only do a, a last couple of things with regard to Muso Sasaki. And, and that's just to, to share uh, a poem or two of his. As you remember, I shared one of the poems at the very beginning of the Te shows on his uh, teaching. And this, this one, is called No End Point. The whole world is clear and empty. To the 10 directions, there is no end point. And yet, when we look carefully, there is one after all. You fly out of this world looking backward, riding the giant rock. It's a mythological bird into the hollow of a lotus thread to live there where heaven and earth were never divided. And that is quite a koan, yes? How can you fit into a lotus thread, much less a lotus seed or a lotus root or a lotus flower? Here he is pointing out the uselessness of attaching to measurements, weights, good, bad, and so on and so forth. And here's Old Creek. Since before anyone remembers, it's been clear, shining like silver. What does this Old Creek represent? Though the moonlight penetrates it and the wind ruffles it, no trace of either remains. Today, I would not dare to expound the secret of the stream bed, but I can tell you that the blue dragon is coiled there. And can you snatch that pearl out of that blue dragon's mouth without being devoured by the dragon? Since before anyone remembers, it's been clear, shining like silver. Though the moonlight penetrates it and the wind ruffles it, no trace of either remains. And the person who has 
realized deeply enough, awakened mind, as one moves through life, one leaves no traces, just as the moonlight leaves no traces in the water. Today, I would not dare to expound the secret of the stream bed, but I can tell you that the blue dragon is coiled there. And this one is called Temple of Eternal Light. The mountain range, the stones in the water, all are strange and rare. The beautiful landscape, as we know, belongs to those who are like it. The upper worlds, the lower worlds, originally are one thing. There's not a bit of dust. There is only this still and full, perfect enlightenment. And yet we keep searching for things, some thing called enlightenment. To that end, I'd like to share with you some of the Zen teaching of Huang Po, who was a Tang Dynasty master. He died in 850, as near as anyone can figure out. Nobody knows when he was born, but he was deeply realized. And he was the teacher to Rinzai. In Japanese, Huang Po is, is known as Obaku. Uh, as you heard before, uh, the, the written language in those days between Japan and China was the same. And so the characters that are used to write the name Huang Po are pronounced those same characters are pronounced obaku in Japanese, which is why any of the Chinese masters have not just two names, they have multiple names, really. And uh, in, in Huang Bo's case, uh, his name, this is the final name, and it refers to his posthumous name, which is the name of the mountain that his monastery was located on. And many of the ancient masters are known by the, the uh, mountain that their monasteries were located on. Huangpo was deeply awakened and pointed to what is beyond ordinary knowledge, but which we can open to, and clearly he had. And as we open to it, we become, to whatever degree, more free. It depends on how deeply we go into that awakening experience and, and what we do with it afterwards as well. These days, most people have a relatively superficial uh, Kensho, and yet we can take it deeper and deeper yet and deeper yet. You know that the great Zen master Hakuin had 19 major Kensho experiences and countless minor ones. This is by his own count. That's a model to emulate. Never to cease practice because there's always deeper to go. And of course, as part of the practice, the more clearly you see because the more deeply you go into awakening, uh, the more you also see where there's work to be done. This is the long maturation that you've heard so much about. And it's absolutely vital in terms of our full Zen practice. To simply sit until you have some level of Kensho, even two or three Kensho, and not to do the inner work that is required when we begin to see where we're caught is a, a terrible disservice to, to ourself and to everyone around us as well. So this book 
Um, the Zen teaching of Huang Bo on the transmission of mind was translated by John Blofeld. John Blofeld was a British man uh, in the era where the British Empire was beginning to break up, but it had not by the time yet that he was an adult. And he felt drawn to China for some unknown reason, and not only to China, but to Buddhism. In England, many, many people traveled to the Far East, uh, some on official business and some just traveling. And apparently one of his aunts had a little Buddhist statue and she gave it to him and he felt some level of unexplained deep affinity with that Buddhist statue. He was just a kid, I think he was 12 years old or something when that happened. But he did go into the British government service so that he would be able to go to China. He did learn Chinese. Uh, at the time, uh, the Chinese were considered lowly people, uh, particularly compared to the British. Uh, the British conquered the peoples of the countries that they, they conquered and uh, considered them more like servants. It caused no end of grief. And actually, uh, there's recently been a, um, an interview by Oprah of Prince Harry. Actually, he, he's not a prince anymore. He's the Duke of Sussex, I believe, and his biracial wife, Megan, who left the royal family, uh, or I should say left the official royal family situation because uh, Megan was uh, feeling quite, quite um, prejudiced against. And there's a lot of uh, feedback about that. Black people living in Britain say they understand completely how she would feel and they know it personally. The royal family uh, said few words about it. Uh, only that this is a, a troubling um, uh, thing to learn. And uh, William, Harry's brother, said, we don't have racial prejudice in the royal family, but clearly it was felt. And so they became, they moved to, uh, well, they moved out of England. And part of this was also because the, the tabloids uh, found Meghan Markle, uh, uh, a tasty morsel to uh, sell newspapers. And, and they hounded her and uh, she's actually won a, a, a lawsuit against at least one of them for revealing something that they should not have been, they, they managed to gain access to illegally. And so they now live in Southern California, right next door to Oprah. There's a lot happening now in America with regard to prejudice. Weighing and measuring. This has no place in Zen. When we see into our true nature, we, we see all beings as equal. None higher or lower or friendlier or less friendly or ugly or stupid or beautiful or wonderful, we see with the eye of equality. At any rate, this was not happening in, in the British Empire. And uh, so Blofeld went there and he had an interesting, uh, inter interesting experience. He actually did connect with a Chinese master and became his disciple. Now it's traditional in China, even now, to when you meet your, your teacher or any other monk, uh, eminent monk, senior monk, uh, you, you immediately drop down into three prostrations wherever you are, whether it's on the street, whether it is in, in a dusty field, it doesn't matter. That's protocol. 
it's honoring your teacher. And he understood that. And at one point, uh, he asked his teacher after they were they were about to part again, if he would see him again. And the teacher hesitated and then said no. And what happened, really, why the teacher had hesitated was because he could see what was going to happen. And indeed, Blofeld was walking in a in a marketplace, I believe, in China with another British man. And uh, he saw his, his old teacher, but the teacher, in order to spare him the embarrassment of dropping down into the dust in front of his British friend, uh, ignored him and pretended he didn't, didn't know it, walked right past him without any acknowledgement. There's so much suffering in the world because we weigh and measure. And Obaku, Huang Po, saw deeper. So let's share some of his words. And first, I'll, I'll share a little bit about Blofeld's, uh, some of Blofeld's words in the translator's introduction. Remember that he was fluent in Chinese, and uh, so he translated this from the Chinese. And here in his foreword, he says, Zen followers hold that the absolute, or union with the absolute, is not something to be attained. And this is, this is important for all of us to comprehend deeply. Awakening is not something that's outside us or that we can gain. It's inherent in us. This true nature is, is us. There's nothing outside of it. So there's nothing we can gain or lose. It's about awakening to it. For Zen followers hold that the absolute or union with the absolute is not something to be attained. One does not enter nirvana. For entrance to a place one has never left is impossible. The experience commonly called entering nirvana is, in fact, an intuitive realization of that self-nature, which is the true nature of all things. The absolute or reality is regarded as having for sentient beings two aspects. The only aspect perceptible to the unenlightened is the one in which individual phenomena have a separate, though purely transitory, existence within the limits of space and time. The other aspect is spaceless and timeless. Moreover, all opposites, all distinctions, and entities of every kind are here seen to be one with the capital O. Yet neither is this second aspect alone the highest fruit of enlightenment? As many contemplatives suppose, it is only when both aspects are perceived and reconciled that the beholder may be regarded as truly enlightened. And even there, there are depths of awakening. So here we are with Huang Po. Our original Buddha nature is in highest truth, devoid of any atom of objectivity. It is void, omnipresent, silent, pure. It is glorious and mysteriously peaceful joy. And that is all. Enter deeply into it by awakening to it yourself. That which is before you is it in all its fullness, utterly complete. There's naught beside. Even if you go through all the stages of a bodhisattva's progress toward Buddhahood, one by one, and, and, and particularly in the Theravadan system, uh, there's a, a whole uh, assumption of, status of uh, state, states of um, progress towards becoming a full bodhisattva. In Zen, no. Even if you go through all the stages of a bodhisattva's progress towards Buddhahood, 
one by one, when at last, in a single flash, you attain the full realization, you will only be realizing the Buddha nature, which has been with you all the time. And by all the foregoing stages, you will have added to it nothing at all. You will come to look upon these eons of work and achievement as no better than unreal actions performed in a dream. That is why the Tathagata, the Buddha said, I truly attained nothing from complete, unexcelled enlightenment. Had there been anything attained, Dipankara Buddha would not have made the prophecy concerning me. He also said, this Dharma is absolutely without distinction, neither high nor low, and his name is Bodhi. It is pure mind with a capital M, which is the source of everything. The source of everything. And which, whether appearing as sentient beings or as Buddhas, as the rivers and mountains of the world, which are has form, as that which is formless, or as penetrating the whole universe, is absolutely without distinctions. There being no such entities as selfness and otherness. And he continues, this pure mind, the source of everything, shines forever and on all with the brilliance of its own perfection. That is you. And yet, as we grow up, we get these ideas about ourselves because in essence, we're taught that we're this way or that way. And if it's negative, uh, even if it's not, we take it often as negative and, and we compensate by lots of different ways. There's a constant self-talk that we give to ourselves, uh, both to make ourselves feel like we actually do exist, but also it has other roles sometimes. Psychologically, if we deny ourselves as being perfect, whole, and complete, if we constantly chastise ourselves, then it makes it easy not to, not to fail. And failure is something that human beings fear mightily until we realize when we have seen deeply into our true nature that there is no such thing as failure. In society, we can be considered to be um, a success or a failure. And certainly in our school years, we're taught um, that we're one or the other or somewhere in between. And we take that to be who we are, which is not at all who we are. So if that isn't, then who are we? It's frightening to let go ideas about succeeding or failing. And so we wrap this self-talk around ourselves so it won't matter. But what we're doing is living in a tiny little narrow dark cave when we do that. When the whole universe lives within us. When the people of the world hear it said that the Buddhas transmit the doctrine of the mind. They suppose that there's something to be attained or realized apart from mind. And thereupon they use mind to seek the Dharma, not knowing that mind and the object of their search are one. Mind cannot be used to seek something from mind. For then after the passing of billions of eons, the day of success will still not have dawned. Such a method is not to be compared with suddenly eliminating conceptual thought. That's the purpose of the breakthrough koans, by the way, to eliminate conceptual thought so that we can open to a more profound reality. 
which is the fundamental dharma. Suppose a warrior, forgetting that he's already wearing his pearl on his forehead, were to seek for it elsewhere. He could travel the whole world without finding it. But if someone who knew what was wrong were to point it out to him, the warrior would immediately realize that the pearl had been there all the time. So if you students of the way are mistaken about your own real mind, not recognizing that it is the Buddha, and it's not outside you, you will consequently look for him elsewhere, indulging in various achievements and practices and expecting to attain realization by such graduated practices. But even after eons of diligent searching, you will not be able to attain to the way. These methods cannot be compared to the sudden elimination of conceptual thought in the certain knowledge that there is nothing at all which has absolute existence. Nothing on which to lay hold, nothing on which to rely, nothing in which to abide, nothing subjective or objective. It is by preventing the rise of conceptual thought that you will realize Bodhi. And I don't know about this term, prevent the rise of perceptual thought. In, in the old days at the Rochester Zen Center, we were admonished, and this is straight from Japan, to cut our thoughts. And what else do you think this means but to stop thinking and, and to actively chop them off at the ankles, if you want to call it that. And that's what I tried to do. And I was actually rather successful about it eventually, until one day I realized that I was so good at chopping them off as they'd start to rise that I was in danger of not being able to think. And thinking is a, is a tool. It has use to get rid of thoughts forever is, is not particularly useful in the human life. But not to attach to thoughts. As we go about our Zen practice, particularly in the earlier years, and particularly in a concentrated situation such as Sashin, we find ourselves uh, at a certain point, and it's almost as if we've got a, a bunch of buzzing flies around our head, uh, and we try to swat them, and they only get more aggressive. These are, these are thoughts. How to work with that? Sink beneath them. There's a commitment in practice to reaching beyond concepts, ideas, assumptions, to what's true. And the more completely committed we are to that, the easier it's going to be not to bother swatting the flies and eventually they'll get tired and disappear. And we'll have sunk deeper into an awareness We're not trying to get rid of something. We're letting go the intense commitment <coughs> to thinking as the be all and end all of life. The constant yada yada in our minds. What is there without it? What is there beyond it? What is there if we see through it and let it go? Are we any more safe for continuing to tell ourselves we're not worthy or not good enough or a failure or any of the other things that most of us have been doing for a long time, having been taught or at least gained the assumption that this is true when we were kids. Has it really kept us safe? It's kept us captive, of course, when all around us is this amazing freedom. 
what is the risk in daring to let go? What is the risk in daring to be embarrassed, daring to be wrong, daring to be uh, something other than what society thinks is ideal? What is the risk? One poi is trying to point this out. Here he says, people are afraid to forget their minds, fearing to fall through the void with nothing to stay their fall. They do not know that the void is not really void, but the realm of the real Dharma. This spiritually enlightening nature is without beginning, as ancient as the void, subject neither to birth nor to destruction, neither existing nor not existing, neither impure nor pure, neither clamorous nor silent, neither old nor young, occupying no space, having neither inside nor outside, size nor form, color nor sound. It cannot be looked for or sought, comprehended by wisdom or knowledge, explained in words, contacted materially or reached by meritorious achievement. All the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas together with all wriggling things possess of life share in this great nirvanic nature. If an ordinary person, when they're about to die, could only see the five elements of consciousness as void, the four physical elements as not constituting an I, a me, the real mind with the capital M as formless and neither coming nor going, his nature as something neither commencing at his birth nor perishing at his death, but as whole and motionless in its very depths. His mind and environment, ob environmental object is one. If he could really accomplish this, he would receive enlightenment in a flash. He would no longer be entangled by the triple world. He would be a world transcender. He would be without even the faintest tendency towards rebirth. If he should behold the glorious sight of all the Buddhas coming to welcome him, Surrounded by every kind of gorgeous manifestation, he'd feel no desire to approach them. And if he should behold all sorts of horrific forms surrounding him, he would experience no terror. He would just be himself, oblivious of conceptual thought and one with the absolute. He would have attained the state of unconditioned being. This then is the fundamental principle. What is being pointed to here? And how can we reach it? How can we realize it? How can we um, perceive it, if you want to call it that? We have this sense that there is something, something vital, something important that is just beyond reach and we can't put it in words. There are no words to describe it really, but there is a sense that it is vital and that we can reach it and that it, it's really, really important to do so. And so we have the different practices in Zen to help us reach by letting go conceptual thought, attachment, and so on. And the most effective of these, in my experience and observation, is the extended out breath. Because as we breathe out and then push it farther out, paying utter attention to the physical experience 
in our bodies of that, it, it requires the dropping off of thought. And because thought cannot reach where we want to reach, where we need to reach to come to awakening, we have to let go of thoughts in order to become awakened. Then it, it's like a fact, fast track in that direction. <clears throat> it helps us enter a samadhi that's deep enough that we forget ourselves totally, which is essential if we are to come to awakening. There can't be a me trying to come to awakening. There can't be a me who is is working towards something called awakening. The only way we can reach it is to forget ourselves completely enough that it becomes obvious. And as we come back into awareness, if we've gone deeply enough, things are different very different. And of course, as you already know, there's that's when the work begins. In these last few hours of Sashin, and it really is just one day in some hours, we have done a lot of work so far to continue to deepen it regardless of what the temptation is to do otherwise, to continue to bring, bring our mind into focus on this yearning, this search. This is how we go deeper. This is how we get closer and closer and closer to truly letting go, which will allow awakening to be revealed. So do your best, do your best. Particularly those of you who have been in the Sashin since the beginning, you've gained a great deal of depth of uh, awareness, even though it might not be obvious. And those of you who have come just for a few of the sittings, still, whatever you've put into it has made a difference. So keep going, keep going. You will not regret it. I thank you for listening. We'll stop now and recite the four vows.